WandaVision is Disney's newest installment to the never-ending proliferation that is the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It focuses on two of their least developed characters, mainly as the name would suggest, Wanda and Vision. Now, as this analysis slash review progresses, I will be going into more and more spoilers. Though at first I will speak in very abstract terms, so you will be free of spoilers. If you want to avoid them altogether, do not watch past this mark. Now, I liked WandaVision, this first part. The first four episodes I think were absolutely, well, marvelous. However, beyond that point the show clearly lacked any vision of how to progress. The first four episodes contained just enough mystery to keep me engaged as the viewer is thrown into the story with some knowledge of who the characters are and the eerie feeling that they don't belong in there. Even if you had not watched any Marvel films before, it quickly becomes apparent that something is not quite right with the seemingly perfect 1950s setting. And I really like the idea of imitating popular shows from different eras, which also served as a narrative tool. This style was consistent throughout the remaining runtime of the show, with WandaVision slowly changing to resemble more modern sitcoms while maintaining this sense that something isn't quite right with the image. From a narrative standpoint, these choices also made sense. The show is primarily about Wanda living out her imaginary perfect suburban life as she struggles to cope with the grief that she feels. However, the show's narrative quickly changes for the worse after the fourth episode. If you get to this shot here, stop watching, it is not worth it. Prior to this shot the show's pacing is immaculate, the lack of direction is still not apparent as the viewer too, like the screenwriter, has no idea what is going on. However, as the mystery starts to unravel, a lot of unnecessary side plots are shoehorned in, thus pacing starts to suffer a lot, and a simple rule of storytelling gets violated. And that is consequences. Or to put it more broadly, cause and effect. When something happens, there should be actions or events happening as a result of the former. A cause and an effect. Simple enough, and extremely fundamental. It is why people hate retroactive continuity, or retcons for short, as they break this simple rule. Retcons change the cause-effect relationship, as the effects don't follow from the causes, since often the writer retroactively modifies the causes. And everyone isn't happy. Ok, so this is cool and all, but how does it apply to WandaVision? Well, let us examine what happens after the end of the fourth episode. We have an interesting few moments where we are shown the chaos that ensued when everyone returned from the snap. This is something that Endgame kind of overlooked, as there everyone seemed to adapt to it rather quickly. But it is interesting to show how people would react to suddenly opening their eyes and four years have passed, as well as the other house population reaction to all of them blipping back into existence. That was pretty cool. But from then on the second plot starts developing, that of the sword group who are investigating the phenomenon that has occurred due to Wanda. Before one could wonder how did our characters appear in this situation whether this is the afterlife or, rather, what Wanda experiences during the four years of the snap. Or perhaps it is some sort of prison, since there is no shortage of references to the Hydra organization. But by the end of episode 5, everything is put in an awfully straight manner. Wanda took an entire town hostage, as she couldn't reconcile with the grief she felt after losing vision. All of the mystery and interest is stripped off and the show now changes direction from what is going on, to how will we defeat Wanda, from something interesting to a rather eh kind of thing. What my issue is with this episode and the next one as the issue persists, is that the viewer is just told everything, nothing is shown. There is a reason why storytelling classes emphasize the importance of show don't tell. It leads to a more interesting story as everything is slowly introduced to the reader. The reader is led on a journey where they discover things from themselves though with the direction of the writer. In contrast, if you just tell the reader at the end the conclusions of the journey they would otherwise have to take, it leads to a rather boring and short experience, and oftentimes quite unimpactful. I don't know why this was done, when the show don't tell principle could have been used by putting more focus on Vision, who has to discover the secret of Westview himself. At one point the show actually got my hopes up. Vision finds that his wife has been mind controlling the entire town for her benefit, and he, like the viewer, is rather unambiguously told that the people are suffering. He then does the next same thing and warns Wanda telling her she cannot do this to people. They both fly up as they threaten each other and 
that is it. Vision continues to uncover more disturbing secrets about Westview, even going so far as to try to connect the outside world for help. However, this conflict is largely forgotten. Wanda is forgiven, and we go to the next big fight that is supposed to be the climax. I guess in this show if the viewer is only shown something but not told explicitly, it doesn't matter. Honestly, these few moments of the town people begging Vision for help and wanted to let them go left a bigger impression on me than any of the talking combined. So great, Wanda has taken an entire town hostage and these guys as servants of the country are here to rescue those under Wanda's non-consensual mind control. Negotiations were attempted and for some unbeknownst reason Wanda acted as even more of a villain during them. Truly gets me to sympathize with our main character. Now, how, despite all of this, does the show keep attempting to portray Wanda as the good hero and the other ones as the villain? They'll never know what you sacrificed for them. Now, if you're a bit confused about this line, let me give you some context. This line is said by this character to Wanda, because the people of the town were throwing none too happy looks at her. All poor Wanda. She's hated by the people she took hostage and to which she brought tremendous suffering. Poor misunderstood Wanda. The people of Westview have every right to hate Wanda. In fact, I wonder why they haven't taken up their pitchforks yet. Perhaps it is more out of fear from her rather than any sort of compassion. Just because Wanda fought and defeated some flying person does not redeem her as a character, especially not in the eyes of these people. In fact, as far as anyone is concerned, Agatha has done nothing wrong. She was in fact the one to free people from Wanda's control and push her to release her grip of the city. Yeah, she did it for her own personal benefits, but her intentions need not be taken into account as it is the actions and choices of the characters by which we judge them. My second issue is with the hero-villain dynamic in the show. I ended up agreeing and rooting more for the two villains of the show than I did for Emo Witch. The first antagonist we meet is Director Hayward. He is a sword operative who is in charge of the task force that is dealing with the anomaly Wanda has created. Now, why is he going to jail? He is dealing with an active hostage situation and after negotiations failed, he went for the logical plan B, kill the terrorist. While well, some will argue that Director Hayward wasn't empathetic since he didn't listen to the opinions of our dear friend Monica. Well, yes, I would even argue that she shouldn't even be allowed to be involved as she has until recently been under Wonder's mind control. No one has any guarantees that this is still not the case and even if she's not, she should take a leave to emotionally recover, as she's clearly not fit to make decisions of sound mind. Or maybe he's going to jail because he lied that Wanda stole Visions' body. Well, sure, not too good, but is it really worse than a literal terrorist? To be honest, I'm still really confused about what his whole plan was in regards to Vision. I think the show did a terrible job to explain what his plan was, much less what any of his motivations were. If someone could explain it to me in a better manner than this nonsensical CBR article, I would be most grateful. Now for the second villain, Agatha. I don't think we needed a second villain to be introduced out of nowhere in the last two episodes. I guess we needed a big fight scene for the final showdown because this is a superhero show. But I think that was the final nail in the coffin for me. A story that is about a person coming to term with their grief should not end in a big flashy fight. In fact, battles don't need to be physical at all. The two visions that showdown is resolved in a library, with them just talking. To present the case where this was I think done much better, Watchmen's ending does include some exchange of punches, but the accent is on the speech by Ozymandias and its consequences. Watchmen's story is not about who is physically the strongest, but it is about a clash of ideas. Hence, the final showdown being largely only verbal. In fact, I would go so far as to say that every fight should be an extension of the ideological battle taking place. When one character triumphs over another, it is not because they were physically stronger, but because the narrative favored their ideas over their opponents. I know battles in anime are a bit of a joke, but they do this so well to the point that it has become a cliché. In anime, the physical battle and physical performance of the characters is largely a reflection of their mental state and battle of ideas. 
Through the fight sequence, the internal changes are portrayed, how either character comes to turn with certain thoughts, or how they resolve strengthens. Wanda's fight with Agatha is largely devoid of such meaning to the narrative. It is mostly a flashy superhero battle. And yes, Agatha was a threat to Wanda, but she was not a threat to the community. I wouldn't exactly call her a villain for this reason. Her reasons and motivation, although a bit bipolar as they kept changing, were because her teachings prophesied that Wanda is a threat to the world, which... is she not? Now, I am not saying that every protagonist needs to be a paragon of virtue and their antagonist some sinister villain hell-bent on world domination. No, in fact, I think this dynamic is rather boring. These perfect virtuous characters often lack any depth and just do what is considered to be textbook right. This is why stories about these characters are largely quite boring. However, what we primarily see is their journey towards becoming the hero, or what you would call origin stories. It is during this journey that our protagonist becomes the perfect defender of good, but can also be shown with some more depth as the reader gets to see them before they have achieved the height of their progress. Through an ordeal, through suffering, through hard choices, does our character emerge as the hero. After this, they are rather quite boring since they can only make wrong decisions. The hero's journey is part of every mythology and likewise with comics being our current variations of myths, they tell stories of the same pattern. So if the perfect hero is too boring and the hero's journey has become too much of a cliché, what alternatives do you have as an aspiring storyteller? Well, you can write about imperfect characters, ones we might even often condemn, but who are so fascinating that they entice the reader. I don't mind characters that do morally questionable acts. Hell, some of my favorite characters are those that follow their goals even if they do not fit in the mode of universal good. For example, Ozymandias was condemned as a mass murderer by those closest to him and even he agreed that what he did was morally great. However, he was prepared to live with the consequences of his actions and made no excuses for them. And that is why I liked Watchmen so much, it tried something quite new. The stereotypical goody-to-shoe heroes were largely quite passive, and thus quite boring, as is the case with most good characters. Usually in a story the villain is the active one, he is the one trying to disturb the status quo and the hero is there just to preserve it. Our modern day entertainment is filled with flawed borderline villain characters, but it is their voracious pursuit of their goal, their activity that enchants us. Light, Lelouch and Walter White are by no means virtuous characters, but their aura, charisma and story are more captivating than any heroes. It is why their respective shows have become quite popular, despite most of us probably not trying to follow in their footsteps. But I digress. I think Wanda could have been portrayed as this more morally mood hero, however Marvel largely lacked the guts to follow through. They'll never know what you sacrificed for them. And what has Wanda sacrificed? What great tragic hero she must be to have given so much for the people. Firstly, at the beginning of the show she has as much as she has in the end of it. Everything she obtains throughout the show was artificial and at the cost of the suffering of a whole town. Secondly, I see no reason why sacrifices have to be made. Why do we have to be in this situation in the first place? Why did the people have to be put under her mind control? Why wouldn't she create this parameter where her family can exist without turning its inhabitants into soulless puppets? Since anyways at the beginning they were trying to hide their powers, why not just alter their appearances and hide in some random town? Sure, Wanda did not understand and control her abilities well enough in the beginning to do that, maybe. But by the end we see her abilities grow quite a lot. So there is currently nothing stopping her from on occasion bringing her family back to reality. If she could do it once, why can't she do it again? At least we are not given any reason why she could only do it at that specific moment. Therefore, the only thing Wanda has sacrificed was her peaceful and quiet life, since people will now actively stray away from her, and for quite a good reason. However, that is not a sacrifice, that is a consequence of her actions. If she had from the start entered into an agreement with some party, 
to use her power to bring her family into reality within an area effect without mind controlling the inhabitants, all of this could have been avoided. But no, we had to frame Wanda as some tragic hero who lost so much and no one likes the emu girl. Boo hoo. Fuck off. Wanda is a criminal and she should have been treated as such. I guess since I'm talking about a Marvel work, thus an analogy within the Marvel Universe would be a better fit. Thanos sacrificed quite a lot for his goal. Not only did he dedicate his whole life to what he believed to be right, but he was forced to sacrifice his daughter to achieve this end. Something which was made evident to have brought him tremendous pain. Now imagine if someone went, oh Thanos, the people will never know what great good you did for them and how much you had to sacrifice for them. No, he was treated as a villain regardless of how much he had suffered because his actions were that of a mass murderer. And that is an important note for all of you aspiring writers. Just because your character has suffered, just because they have made sacrifices, does not make them a righteous or a virtuous character. It is their actions and thoughts which will show their characteristics. And from what I've seen so far, Wanda is nothing but a whiny brat that believes she is entitled to more because of my tragic backstory. Fuck off, Wanda. I hope in some future iteration of the Marvel Cinematic Universe you are treated as the villain that you are. Overall, I would not recommend the show too much, as it started off quite well, and because of that will leave you with a rather unpleasant feeling of disappointment. Ironically, if it had been of the same quality throughout its entire runtime, I might have enjoyed it more, whether it was consistently mediocre or consistently good. But it is precisely because it started so well that I am so disappointed by the meek turnout. Now, I am aware that the show was made in some more trying times, so I'll try not to blame too much the screenwriters, the directors or the actors for the flop that it was at the end. I will instead rate this show by itself to be a rather poorly written story, thus meriting itself a noble score of eh out of 10. Watch at your own discretion.